thank you so much for being on the show, Harrison. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Um, I think you're my first undergraduate ever on the show. I'm so excited to actually um, talk to someone who's actually learning while they're um, you know, making things. Um, let's talk a little bit about who you are, what you do. Um, what's uh, BCI guys? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Harrison Canning. As you said, uh, I am in my undergraduate. Um, I'm 22 right now in my final semester, so I'm almost out and I'm very excited to be because I've got so many projects and stuff that I'm working on, which we'll get to in a second. But um, so I go to the Rochester Institute of Technology and the University of Rochester. I'm in a dual program studying neurotechnology, which is kind of the underlying theme for all of the stuff that that I'm interested in. So. As you mentioned, I'm uh, working on BCI guys right now, where BCI stands for brain computer interface. So we're really into controlling devices with your mind um, and various projects, and then in other ways to help people communicate and move. Um, and so that is a media company where we create educational and hopefully entertaining content around neurotech and brain computer interfaces. And then at my university, I started a research group um, slash club um, that is producing um, content, uh, or sorry, that is um, doing research and working on uh, projects related there. Um, one of the interesting part um, with what you're doing is that uh, most people, you know, get to undergraduate programs, you know, and grapple with um, a couple of courses, find out if they like it or not, even change courses. You, on the other hand, um, come with a very powerful motivation into the program um, based on what you have lived through. Um, we, we talked about um, a bad concussion you've had from an assault. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was younger, I'd wanted to be a robotics engineer. I was really, really into math and science and robots and just technology in general seemed really cool to me. Um, but then uh, when I was 13 years old, I was assaulted um, in the town next to me. Uh, I didn't know the kids. It was just kind of a freak thing, but a group of eight boys just attacked me um, over a period of a little over an hour. Um, and that gave me uh, a really bad traumatic brain injury among you know, other, other issues related to that. Um, and, and it took a lot for me. Um, I had a lot of difficulty reading and writing um, and oftentimes speaking as a result of the head pain and then also some of the trauma that I went through related to that. Um, and so there was, there was a long period of time where um, there wasn't much outside interaction that I had because the concussion protocol at the time was just to kind of sit in a room um, and stare at the wall until your, uh, until your headaches go away. And they, they just, they didn't go away. Um, and there were lots of questions about, would I be able to take care of myself in the future and have a job and all of these things? And as you can imagine, uh, especially with having these aspirations of wanting to work on robots and really hoping that that would that would help people, help people out in the homes, make things more efficient, et cetera. Um, I was quite depressed at feeling like, okay, at 13, like what is the rest of my life gonna look like? And you know, it just, things change so quickly. Um, but then uh, I was just kind of, while I was, while I was sad and thinking about this stuff, I was thinking about an exosuit that I had wanted to design to help people with ALS uh, or muscular dystrophy and move around. So these are people that, uh, have neuromuscular uh, disorders that don't let them uh, control their bodies the ways that, that we do. And so the question of how do you uh, build an exosuit and control the exosuit is, is really difficult because if they don't have muscle control, how do you actually do this? And I think as a result of a lot of the, the stuff that was going on with my head and being in and out of neurologists' offices, I was thinking, well, I understand that the brain is sending electric signals out to the muscles. I wonder if just like a robot, we could uh, use these signals to actually control the exosuit. So I started doing a little bit of research and I found that this, that this already was happening under the term brain computer interface. And I found this amazing uh, video out of Brown University that I think came out around 2013 using the brain gate system, which is an invasive electrode grid that you plant, implant right into the brain. And it was showing someone who had been paralyzed for almost 15 years feeding herself using a robotic arm. And my mind was just blown um, of that this is actually possible and, and happening. And it just kind of opened a world of possibilities uh, within me of what this technology could end up doing. One for people um, who have disabilities and, and to help uh, improve quality of life for them, but then also for, for everyone else and just 
redefining what human computer interaction looks like and having it in a more human way. Um, and sort of that idea of making technology more human uh, gave me this idea of, you know, in the future, I want to start a company and I want to work in this field. And it really gave me a goalpost to shoot for that uh, inspired me to work really hard in, in rehab and push myself through the pain and stuff to work on um, my own my own projects and then eventually go to college to study neurotechnology and work on the stuff that I'm working on now. Um, well, uh, I've recently been researching a little bit about um, bionics um, companies, um, extra body suits, um, but we're going to get to that. But I do understand at 13, um, it's really hard to get yourself out of that rut um, if you have been a part of an assault. Um, and I want to dwell a little bit on um, the moment. What what did it take to actually come out of that and be so positive um, at such a young age where people are still grappling with other problems, not, not only um, the, um, the foresight um, into the future, what they're going, to, what's going to become um, of them. And you didn't not only think about yourself, but also how you can change um, and make things better for other people who might be suffering um, through the same um, fate. Uh, what kept you going? Yeah, so so as I said, that first year was really difficult because it just seemed like all of these ideas of of what I thought you know life would be, and you know, as you're when you're 13 and you're young, you're like, ah, this is my dream job, and I'm going to do this, and you have all the answers, and you feel like everything is, uh, you know, like oh, that I you know I I know what I want to do and and stuff like that. What did you want to be um, before the assault? So robotics engineer. I wanted to be an engineer. I was really strong in in math and science and. Um, people told me that if you're good at those things, you should be an engineer. And I just thought robots were really cool. Um, I remember when I was younger going into some little like New York City uh, underneath a building shop with all these little robots. And I was like, all right, I want to do that. Um, but, you know, this was all kind of shattered and turned upside down when I lost these abilities. And one of the one of the things that I struggled with the most and still struggle with is, is mathematics ability. And all of these things, like losing it all at once, it kind of comes to the realization of, okay, maybe I'm not gonna be able to do these things that I wanted to do or, or to be an engineer. And then also, as you said, you know, when I'm young and going into high school, cause that's, that's the age, I think this happened at the, this, this happened at the tail end of, of seventh grade. Um, that's an important social time and all of that stuff. And so when I was going into college or into high school, rather, I had a lot of difficulty speaking and that would be embarrassing and made it socially isolating because I would be talking and I would throw in a word that didn't make any sense or I would just kind of stop mid-sentence and be unable to continue. And so that made me kind of draw within myself. But in terms of what inspired me to get out of this, it was, it was really this idea of bringing brain computer interfaces to the public and creating these consumer devices that would come out um, to you know, make this, make the experience of computing more human. And just to speak on that for a second, what I mean by that is by incorporating multi-sensory elements into our interactions with data. So I'm talking to you right now on Zoom, something that everyone is familiar with as a result of the events of the last couple of years. And I, it's amazing that I can see your face and talk to you, but it's still not the same as an in-person interaction, right? And so there's a lot of data that's that's being missed in this interaction. And so how can we provide data to people in a way where you can actually feel it or sense it or get emotion from it? Um, and that's one of the things that, that really drives me is just making stuff intuitive. And so all of these ideas kind of came together in this idea of a future company that I want to create. And the, you know, this, this vision of the company wasn't super well formed. I was 13, but I had, a, I had a vision to shoot for. And so I thought, okay, maybe I won't be an engineer, but I could still be a business leader. And so I looked up to people like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, and I said, okay, what did, what do they do? What are their traits? What are their habits? What do they do throughout the day? And how can I learn to emulate that? Um, and so I studied that very, very intensely. And, you know, and one of the one of the things that was important in that was public speaking. And that was really helpful for me to try to practice that because, as I mentioned, I was having a lot of difficulty speaking beforehand. And so I started forcing myself to 
public speak or raise my hand and talk in front of the class, small things like that as much as possible, which eventually helped me get over one, the fear of, of talking and having the wrong word come out and two, help me work on those abilities. And so it was, it was things like that and trying to incorporate those into my day-to-day -day life that I think really in, in, a, in a way, it sounds cliche, but saved me in terms of going down this path because I think otherwise I, I would have been depressed and I'm not sure what life would have looked like. But in other ways too, like I saw that a lot of these leaders that I looked up to were very, very um, careful with their time and regimented out parts of their day. And so in high school, I, I built this software program that would track every minute of my day and tell me how to optimize things and had all of these habits. Now that turned out to be insane, like in terms of actually doing that um, through, like, through a sustainable, like long-term thing. But I did it for a while and it was also helpful in me predicting when I would get headaches and learning how to uh, work around that piece and to be as productive as I, as I could be while dealing with some of these challenges, these challenges that I had. And then other things too, like I, um, I couldn't have a job in high school because you know the, the traditional jobs that you get, maybe you're working in food services, it's loud. It's loud, and that would make that would give me such a bad headache in loud environments that you know I could get very dizzy and need to sit down or just have a migraine. It's it's hard to work through that stuff. So one of the things that I that I ended up doing was starting um, two small businesses in in high school, very small. The first one was I would buy electronics and cosmetics because the um, the returns were really high on cosmetics. So I <laughs> learned, learned a little bit about that and then just sell them on various websites like eBay, Bonanza, that one's a throwback, Bonanza and, um, and Amazon and then build my own websites. Um, and then later on, you know, I, I did, uh, I had a very, very small little design company um, of one where I would just go to small businesses and help build websites. Uh, but that allowed me to be in control of my own time and work when I didn't have headaches and uh, you know, I probably made a little bit more than I would have been just doing a normal job anyway, and got my feet wet in terms of doing business stuff. So that was all, that was all helpful. And I'm grateful that I kind of went down that path. It's very remarkable that, you know, you actually turn your weaknesses into strength um, and turned out to be on top of things that um, you had certainly at some point must have thought that you would never become uh, pro at. And I was just wondering, did you have enough support around you when you were grappling those challenges, like your parents, your friends, um, anyone who, um, you know, see you from the sidelines and cheered you on? Yeah, I mean, my, my mom in particular was really wonderful in supporting me. Um, she took a job where she would be able to work from home long before that was commonplace and took care of me all the time and never lost hope in terms of bringing me around to doctors and all and, and that kind of thing. Um, I, I mean, I saw over 30 doctors over a period of a couple of years, tried so many different medications. She would bring me to acupuncture and various other things, just trying to find anything that works um, and was a relentless fighter in, in that for me. And without that as well, I know that I wouldn't be able to be in a place where I am now where I don't have headaches uh, nearly as much. It's it's quite rare for me to have a migraine now. It's only like a couple of times a month. Um, and I'm able to, to work on these things and perform at a high level. And I owe a lot of that to her uh, and, and, and you know, the, all of those people that have helped me along the way, so. Well, I guess it's certainly deserved a shout out to all the great moms who've done wonderful yeah. things um, <laughs> for us. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, what you're doing um, at the moment, trying to create awareness um, publicly speaking about um, tech scientific revolutions that can make human suffering um, a lot less than what um, it is at the moment, um, especially with um, the prosthetics um, and body suits. Uh, I talked about Bionics and the company was doing great work in um, exoskeletons, um, a body suit that originally came from uh, Dartmouth research uh, about um, what to do with people um, who have um, disabilities. Um, and unfortunately, I've had a great mentor that um, I've lost th for uh, through uh, motor neuro disease, and it was very painful to see um, in yeah, him sorry. in his lifetime. 
Um, thank you. And I, I was just wondering, uh, you talk a lot about uh, body suits in your videos. Um, how do you see the developments, recent developments in, in that area? What can it potentially contribute to um, what we um, don't have at the moment? And what does the future look like uh, possibly? Yeah, so we're at a really, really exciting time for neurotechnology in general and a lot of these robotics implementations. So you see on, we, we kind of have two sides to this, to this coin. We have one, which is learning to interpret brain signals and how can we use that to actually control neuroprosthetic devices. And then the other side is, is the robotic side, which I think people might be a little bit more familiar with. So I, I think We've all seen these videos from Boston Dynamics where we have these incredible robots that are balancing and are much more athletic than, than I am um, doing all of these things running around. And so we have that piece of development, which is, which is excellent to show that the technology can get there. And so now neurotechnologists are trying to get the other piece across the line, which is how can we reliably harvest brain signals um, to then control this device in a way that the person wants. And so, then there are two pathways that you can go down. You can go the invasive route um, where you're implanting electrodes, uh, various electrodes into uh, parts of the brain or peripheral nervous system that have an effect over muscle control. And the really nice thing uh, about neuromuscular disorders um, or, or one thing at least that makes this possible is for the most part, the higher level areas in the brain that control muscles like the motor cortex uh, remain intact. So if you put an electrode grid in there, and this is an area that is fairly well mapped out, that neurotechnologists know generally where the, the areas are, you can train someone to pretty reliably move um, a prosthetic arm. And this has been done quite a bit. There's a lot of DARPA-funded research that, that you can find just searching, like brain-controlled arm will return a lot of hits around this, where there's actually quite a bit of, of dexterity. There was one great uh, video that came out from Johns Hopkins in December of 2020 that showed that a man was able to use two arms uh, at, the same, at the same time to cut a slice of bread and feed it to himself. So we really do have quite a bit of dexterity from that. And a lot of these arms are starting to provide uh, sensory feedback as well by stimulating the sensory cortex. And then on the other end of the spectrum, for people that aren't as keen to get brain surgery, there are non-invasive implementations that do work as well. So Miguel Nicolelis comes to mind. He is a researcher from Brazil. Now I believe he's at either Duke or, or University of Pennsylvania. Um, I think probably UPenn now. Um, and he his lab um, has he his lab produced an exosuit through the Walk Again project that was controlled by non-invasive EEG electroencephalography brain signals. And all that they were looking for there is the intention to move. I'm imagining moving my legs forward. And then the robot would do the rest and, and walk forward while they have that intent. And one really cool thing that made this visible is, I forget what year, I think it was 2014, but they had uh, a man who was paralyzed from the waist down kick out the first ball at, uh, at the soccer match for the World Cup. And that was a really exciting moment for, for Neurotech. And it also shows that we are on a great path to actually make this a reality within the home um, at some point within the next decade or decade and a half. Um, it's very interesting you talked about that. You know, I've had um, Greg Gage on the show, a phenomenal neuroscientist. We were talking about um, some of the things um, yesterday. Um, and I don't know if you have come across the new book by Jeff Hawkins, The Thousand Brain Theory, um, a very interesting one. Um, so, but one of the problems with um, these, both the invasive and non-invasive uh, therapy is the signal to noise ratio. Um, mm -hmm. How much is the signal and how much um, is the noise and how do we actually separate that? Um, there are pros and cons, I believe, for both of them. Uh, for, with human subjects, probably um, the issue of invasive uh, in chip implants um, is a more serious one. And they've been tried um, like on neural link monkeys already. So yeah, we know that you know it works, but how safe it is, um, you know, and then there are electrode scarring problems, things like this. How do you actually um, see um, 
this thing evolved for example um in google's um adventure ai series they talk about um, georgia tech research from peter weinberg's lab where they put a prosthetic um arm um, on a guy who had his um arm amputated um mm -hmm. and it learned through machine learning what finger is trying to actually move so i was just wondering what are some of the technical challenges um that are impeding our progress towards um, a time where people would actually comfortably use um, a prosthetic arm or leg or any part um, as natural extension of their uh, body. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, the signal to noise ratio is, is a really difficult thing, especially for dealing with non-invasive technology. So we are measuring with EEG. So the, these are electrodes that are placed on the scalp. Um, listeners may have seen like these these uh, caps with a bunch of wires coming out. Um, this is what I'm referring to. And the problem is you're recording from neurons, which are very tiny and emit very, very small signals. So actually the signals that we're looking to pick up are a, a AA battery is, uh, has 25,000 times the voltage of some of these signals that we're picking up. So these are very, very tiny signals. And when they're so small, we have to amplify them. And when you amplify them, you get a lot of other noise, which could even be something uh, as simple as from a nearby power line. Um, so in the United States, power lines uh, operate at 60 hertz. And so you have to put a 60 hertz filter to immediate to move that data because even a nearby power line will affect it. Cell phones and muscle movements have big effects. So you have to look for signatures of each of these, of each of these things if we're using non-invasive technology and filter that out. And so that already starts to limit the amount of data that, that we can look at. And the other piece is that at any given point with DEG, you're sampling probably you know, a billion neurons or so. And obviously, like if you are sampling at such a large uh, area, such a large number of neurons, you don't have a tremendous amount of specificity. So you have to look at overall trends for this control. Now, if you use invasive systems, you can record uh, as specific as an individual neuron. It's very expensive to, to do this over the whole brain, and there are obviously issues of damage like you talked about, but we at least have proven that we do have the specificity to be able to do these things. So then it kind of becomes a question of which neurons are we targeting, which populations of neurons are we targeting, and what is the kind of end goal with, with what we want to do. And so part of, the, part of the problems with this, like you said, are uh, biological responses. So you can have scarring of tissue, um, and there are also other issues that Neuralink is trying to address, like cutting into a blood vessel, because blood is toxic to neurons, so you, you don't want that blood getting out there. Um, and trying to avoid these, these two types of things make the, make the systems last a lot longer. Because in the beginning, when these electrode grids were being implanted, it would last a couple weeks, maybe a month, which I don't think is worth having brain surgery for on, on a person to just have something that have a, a chip in your brain that, that isn't useful after a little while. But now we're looking at seven, eight years. Um, in fact, I, was, I heard a researcher a couple of days ago that said that they had one that they were recording from a monkey for 14 years. So it's getting up there. And if we actually have a useful technology that's implanted that can last that long, um, the more we can push that, the more likely it is that this will become um, useful in either a clinical or even consumer setting. Let's dissect it a little bit deeper. Um, it's yeah. not only the problem uh, with the kind of chips we would actually use um, for um, recording um, those uh, brain waves, but it's also the problem between different subjects. So um, if you were to look at some of the yes. lucid dreaming research, um, it has found that you know the brain waves that are being emitted from um, an individual subject um, sometimes vastly differ from um, other subjects. And that itself becomes a huge problem um, in identifying if we are recording the exact phenomena. And that's very off-putting for someone who has actually put a lot of um, effort in the research. So what can we actually do to find some kind of mutual understanding about what waves are being emitted um, when someone sleeps? Because this, in, in many cases, appears to be very diff diff different from each other and could be anyone's guess. 
Yeah, so this is actually something that we are working on in my lab right now. So I mentioned this uh, early in the beginning, but we started a uh, we started a neurotechnology research lab that's entirely undergraduate student run, which is the the first at our university. We got a grant um, and some lab space for that, and one of the ongoing human subject. Uh, research trials that we are working on is collecting motor imagery data. So motor imagery is imagined movement up, down, left, and right. And then we, we our, our hope is that if we can develop a good control uh, system out of that, that we can then use that to drive a wheelchair, uh, move a selector around on a keyboard to type, those sort of things. And we are designing our experiment in a way where each person that comes into the lab has to come back once a week for five weeks. Because even in an individual person with EEG data, with non-invasive data, you have a tremendous amount of variability over time. And so what we are testing and trying to figure out is in a large enough sample set, can we start to create uh, a couple cases that people might fit into, a couple boxes that people might fit into where we can start to detect, oh, their brain signals kind of match uh, this group of people, and so we can start tuning the algorithm on, you know, on, on this space over here. So we at least can try to cut down some of that learning time. But you're absolutely right. I mean, just in general, there's so much variability between people that it becomes very hard to transfer research and, and uh, a system from person to person. And one of the other things that's really difficult for neurotechnologists is that, and again, this is especially true for non-invasive technology, is that there is anywhere from 15 to 30 percent uh, of the population, depending on the group that you're looking at, that is BCI illiterate. And that just means that some people are just unable to modulate their brain waves in a consistent way, which is what you're doing when you're using these devices to actually use uh, a brain computer interface. And that's not correlated with intelligence or anything like that. It's just that some people can't do it. And so this obviously is presents a huge problem for making a consumer device that goes out there and you're trying to sell it to people or again in a clinical setting, if there's a large segment of the population that just doesn't use it or that just can't use it. But these things start to go away with some other technologies. So the closer you get to a, a neuronal level, um, some of the, if you target specific areas like the motor cortex, a lot of those uh, vari uh, variations go away. You still have to learn how to do it, but there's a higher rate of ability for people to use these signals and use these devices. Um, and so, and then there are other technologies, not invasive, like there's one called FNIRS, which stands for Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy, which is looking at uh, blood flow in the brain to determine what areas are active. It's kind of similar to fMRI. Um, and these show more promising results from what I've seen in terms of being applicable to uh, a wider population and can be more robust individual brain differences. But yeah, this is one of the biggest challenges that neurotechnologists face. Um, let's talk about some practical issues um, that appear um, in the wake of um, these inconsistencies between uh, the measurements. Um, if we actually put a, out um, those electrodes on the brain and they're recording these measurements and they are so vastly different from each other, so it's almost um, literally uh, uninterpretable, how is that possible that um, the latest tech and gears like Apple Watch can tell us the stress levels um, and um, you know, the sleep levels and um, your heartbeat level with such so much accuracy that that's not even placed on your scalp so that, you know, there has to be a lot bigger um, signal to noise ratio uh, problem. And there's a channel on YouTube. I don't know if you're familiar with that. that this one Austrian guy, you know, who compares uh, the uh, wearable tech uh, with the um, industry standard instrument like uh, Hypnodyne Z uh, for sleep research um, and the Dynamo Z that you can wear on your chest um, to find the heartbeat and then match it with the Apple Watch and then you know, give some kind of verdict about you know that's if cool. that's good enough um, or not. Uh, is it really reliable? Is it just marketed very well or just people have this need to believe in something? <laughs> no, it, it is for, for those types of things because you're dealing with a lot simpler bio data that you're, that, you're, that you're handling from, right? So a lot of times that stress response might come from looking at increases in pulse or possibly even activity. I don't know what Apple's exact algorithm is, but 
they are dealing with very, very different signals. And so that's a lot more concrete. You can, we've been measuring pulse for a long period of time, blood pressure, all of these things. And so that is something that they can concretely draw like, oh, they're probably a little bit more stressed right now, um, or they should do this thing. Maybe they're, they're active, right? Things like that. But when you're dealing with the brain, we're dealing with 86 billion neurons and over a trillion connections. And so there's a lot more complexity there. And the, and, you know, the human, human consciousness is so, is so challenging and, and such a difficult problem that to try to understand what someone's mental state is, is quite difficult. Um, now, something, something like a stress response or uh, basic emotional testing is something that can be done with, with EEG right now. Um, but the reliability is not there nearly as much as the biodata that we would be collecting from a smartwatch just because of the tremendous complexity in the system in the brain that we're dealing with. So. Could it be the um, one of the ways to fix um, that problem is to um, aggregate other data that is simply not EEG um, or mm -hmm. EMG, for example, SpO2 levels um, and um, the sleep levels, for example, we know from um, at least from the psychological realm, we know that, you know, people who have had enough sleep, you know, they generally are more um, stressed um, and their performance is not as good as um, um, other um, competitive athletes, um, for example, if they haven't had enough sleep before the night of the tournament, you know, most people would perform bad in comparison to their other cohort groups. Um, so is there a way that um, actually Apple uses um, these other indicators to decide if a person is stressed or not? Because otherwise, if it's only based on EMD or, um, or AG or, you know, simple um, signals, that can easy, you can easily be fooled by the fact that if you've been running for quite some time and your heartbeat is elevated, for you know, for a long time, you know, it could si simply tell you that you're stressed, but you're just tired. Yeah, no, it, it's kind of funny because in the research that I've done and in my lab, we try to isolate data as much as possible. So we want to say, now nah, we don't want any EEG, we don't want any of these other, th or we don't want any EMG. We only want to focus on EEG or something like that for a specific for a specific study, but. In terms of making devices that are going to be useful to people and better predictors, yeah, um, a more holistic approach makes sense. The more data that we can get, the better. And Apple and Google and those companies producing these types of smart devices try to collect a ton of data and have a ton of data on us. And so, yes, it makes sense that I'm sure you could probably detect someone's stress level just by their phone habits. Someone jumps on their phone and scrolls through Instagram a certain way. And it's like, oh, they're, they're probably stressed. And so combining that with bio data is going to be increasingly reliable to, to do that. Um, and EMG, electromyography, as, as you mentioned, is a really good, a, a really accurate technology as well compared to, to EEG because muscles act as a biological amplifier. I mentioned we were dealing with very, very small signals um, in the brain, but muscle signals are several orders of magnitude larger. And so if you can develop a system uh, based on your goals to, uh, to incorporate both, then that's going to be more accurate than just using one technology for sure. One example that I can think of that we did to, to help train some of our undergrads uh, was to control a little drone. So we use focus um, from EEG. We can detect focus pretty well based on their brain waves. Um, and so if we use that to go up and down and then we use EMG. So placed on muscles on your right forearm and your left forearm to turn right and left just by flexing those muscles. And so that combined approach definitely produces uh, a better overall system if you're focused on the functionality. Um, if you're focused on research, you try to isolate as much as possible. And one of the things that I'm deeply interested in, um, and I've practiced for a long, long time, um, and finally from the perspective of neurotech um, that is now coming to light, that uh, meditation certainly um, engenders a certain state of mind. So we have this uh, Tibetan monk um, in Canada, I don't just remember the name, um, but we have put him for multiple times um, in an um, EEG um, or fMRI scanner. And we found out that, you know, the amount of delta wave that his brain generates naturally um, is something that people gain after many weeks of meditation. And I'm just wondering if there is an evidence uh, from the literature that we have um, that, you know, human brain is plastic and actually, you know, focusing meditation and practicing um, to create those new neural paths actually work? 
Oh yeah, for sure. In terms of in terms of the question of is the is the brain plastic? Absolutely. And that is the biggest advantage that humans have over any other animals is that we are born as a blank slate so that we can learn uh, new skills and continue to change our brains. And this this continues throughout our, our life, even though it's a little bit less than than it is when we're younger. And so in, specifically in, in the meditation question, I haven't studied this personally, but I've read papers certainly that have shown, that have suggested pretty strong results that you can increase your focus ability and your, and your ability to modulate your brain state a lot better when you engage in these activities. And so you talked about delta waves, just to, to give a, a quick overview to, to anyone listening. One of the ways that we try to interpret brain data, because it is so complex, is by classifying different, different waveforms based on their hertz, based on how many cycles we have per second. And so delta waves are the largest oscillations. It's usually zero to four hertz. And I say usually, usually because frustratingly, neuroscientists have all different uh, lines where they draw between a delta wave and a theta wave and stuff. But delta waves are associated with sleep, deep, deep stages of sleep. So this is when your uh, brain is very synchronized and firing together. Uh, theta waves are kind of the next step up, and this is what we might see during REM sleep or deep, deep relaxation. Alpha waves are kind of your meditative state, maybe you've just, or like when you've just woken up and you're, you know, a little bit tired, you're very relaxed. Beta is the, is the next one that's indicating normal wakefulness. And then gamma um, is your just like hyper, hyper focus or anxiety. And so we use these classifications because it's pretty easy for the trained eye to just look at data in real time and say, ah, it looks like they're a little bit more awake or they're a little bit more focused or they're asleep right now. And the interesting thing that I've seen with people who meditate a lot, and especially people who practice meditating with some sort of an EEG device, is that they can get their brain on their own to move between a couple of these, uh, these wave types. So you could be like, okay, I'm going to relax my brain a little bit more now and then start triggering within the alpha range. And then I'm going to focus a little bit more and actually bring that up. And that ability certainly could probably help with, um, that ability could certainly help with, um, you know, having better focus or deeper sleep and things like that. So one of the great things about a brain is that it's um, certainly very neuroplastic, but, um, other part which is more fascinating is that you can rewire the brain um, even if you have lost some part of it. For example, I shared um, a wonderful uh, chapter from the book um, of computational neuroscience um, a couple of weeks ago on my um, LinkedIn, uh, which had a peculiar case of a guy who only had half a brain, but you know, hmm. all his functions were normal because the other half has taken control of uh, what was missing um, on the other half. And we in psychology uh, intro psych courses, we have um, you know, very famous um, case of uh, Lin uh, Phineas Gage, um, who mm -hmm. was a guy um, who had lost uh, some part of his uh, prefrontal cortex um, after an explosion um, in the mines, and certainly his personality changed um, overnight and it became very disagreeable um, from what he used to be. Uh, tell us a little bit about how this whole rewiring thing works. Uh, for example, I, I mentioned about um, this prosthetic arm um, in the Georgia Tech um, lab, um, which simply connected um, the um, the pathways from the rest of the arm and to the prosthetic and through machine learning um, algorithms, um, the guy could actually figure out which finger he was moving. So how does it rewiring actually work and what are the implications of that uh, for New York Tech? Yeah, definitely. So it it's a little different in the periphery because the signals that we're getting are much less complex. It's more, you can think of it more as like a wire. So for the example that you just gave um, with the Georgia Tech arm, it's what you're trying to do, you're trying to get as close as possible to taking the original signals that would go to the muscles and use that to actually control the fingers. Uh, another thing that, that they can do is re -innervate muscles, which is really interesting. So that just means that you take a nerve and help guide it to grow into a new muscle and attach onto that muscle. And so they can, they can use that um, as a control system where they might actually remove a part of muscle from, the other, from another part of the body 
uh, attach it somewhere else, teach the person how to use that, and then you can use these for EMG signals. And so, so that's really interesting, but the part of neuroplasticity and, and how does you, how do you learn to actually do that and activate different muscles uh, is really the greatest strength of, of the human brain that we have. And we find that through all stages of life, uh, people maintain a fairly high level of neuroplastic ability to, to change their brain to learn new abilities. And this is what's happening every time you create a new memory, every time you learn something, when you learn how to ride a bike, all of that stuff, you're physically changing what's called the connectome, which is the very unique fingerprint of how your, of how your neurons are connected. You're physically creating and destroying connections. And both the creation and destroying is very, very important for learning. And so where we can see that is an ex as an example is in the developing brain. I mentioned before that humans are born with a blank slate and that is, that's very much true. If you compare a human baby to let's say a giraffe, the giraffe can do a lot more. The giraffe comes out and within an hour is able to run around and has instincts and all of these things. A human baby is pretty unable to fend for itself for a very long time and we continue to develop like our, we continue to see large developments in our brain up until about the year uh, 25. So I've still got a couple of years to go and I'm trying to make the most of that as, as much as possible. But, um, but it's very interesting because the period from when you're born to about 10 years old is a period of rapid connection development. And so the young brain is going around and it is trying to make connections between absolutely everything. And so this is a, a period where lots and lots of connections are forming but they're not that strong. And so when the period from 10 to 20 is a period of pruning where we're actually destroying a lot of these connections and new ones are being made as well, but for the most part, connections are being destroyed. And a 20 year old actually has half as many connections as a 10 year old, because you're going through this process of, of trying to learn and refine information. And an example I can give as to why that would be important is when you have a little kid and you're, you're teaching them uh, vocabulary and, and to identify objects, they might learn what a dog is, right? But then they might incorrectly classify a horse as a dog when a horse is not a dog, but they see brown animal, four legs, that's a dog, that's what I know a dog is. But the process of pruning is trying to break that connection. And so when you actually see a dog, you see all of the features of what a dog is. Okay, the fur kind of looks like this, the tail, you know, like pulling apart all of the features of what a dog is and breaking the connections that associate that with the word horse or associate the image of a horse with the word dog. Um, and so humans are very feature driven. And the other interesting thing about that too is that you can create a prototype in your mind of what a dog looks like, right? And then be able to see a new animal and add it to that, uh, to that previous prototype that you have. But you know, neuroplasticity is implicit in all of this, in, in all learning that we do. And it's, I, I think in some way it's empowering because in, in my own personal story, I had to relearn how to read in some ways and to learn how to speak and to eventually try to get rid of pain. And all of this happens because of neuroplasticity and with a very, very conscious effort, you can you know, change behavior and learn new things and that sort of thing. Does that answer your question? I can go into more depth. Absolutely, but, but you know you shouldn't go into depth. I mean, we can take it one for, step further. Um, what is yeah. what do you think is the core difference between um, the human brain and the animal brain? You know, I have, one of the theories that Jeff Hawkins actually postulates in his book is that you know all other mammals um, and other families of um, animals they have something called old brain or the primitive brain, which is only the limbic system. It's um, and human beings seventy percent of those. The difference between the other um, between the other species is the, um, the neocortex um, that is built on top of that. That actually gives us the intellectual um, edge over all these um, other animals. And this takes a lot of time to mature in comparison with other animals like you just said um, for example it takes over 25 years uh, for uh, the prefrontal cortex to mature in a um, human baby um, and that's a long um, time um, in comparison with, with any other animal um, and that certainly means a lot in, in terms of um, our survival and our behavior. So if you look, um, listen to some of the lectures from Robert Sapolsky at Stanford, one of the brilliant um, the researchers um, in human behavior and their biological origins. Um, it gives us um, a lot of 
um, intellectual ability, but it also takes a lot of time to mature. So do you think that there are other repercussions um, arising from our late maturation? Yeah, I mean, not so much now um, in, in the modern world uh, that we're living in, but definitely when we were a more primitive species, it's, it's a gamble that evolution is taking to invest so many resources in, in a person, in raising, um, in raising a baby and raising a human to, you know, like you really have to equip that person well for, for the world that they're, that they're living in. And so, but one of the beautiful things that, that comes out of this kind of blank slate idea is that we are able to live in a world where there are computers and where technology is advancing and life is just so much different than what uh, a primitive human would have dealt with. And if you took an early human, uh, an early homo sapien and brought them to today, they would be able to learn how to inter interact in this world. And that is something that's pretty much unique to, to just humans because instead of having these instincts and, and hardwired connections that come with a lot of other animals, we come again with a blank slate that can be molded by experience and by learning. Let's talk about some other problems that um, are way um, less dramatic than amputation. Um, it, yeah. it could be, um, it has to do something with a stress um, or um, a physical disorder that is very painful. And there are two ways that um, you've talked about in your video, also in general consensus of, uh, among researchers is that there are two promising um, researchers, researches that that is emerging um, to alleviate that. One is the neuropharmacology way, um, using SSRIs mm -hmm. and other um, um, drugs that would bind um, through the neurotransmitters that would uh, alleviate our pain. And the other um, form, uh, which Jak Panksepp talk about um, with his rat experiments, um, is neuromodulation. But let's first talk about the neuropharmacological uh, intervention. And one of the problems with the um, SSRIs um, is that you know you never know when it can become addictive. So we recently had Jordan Peterson, one of the most influential psychologists actually fell in the trap of benzos. Um, so that actually kind of suggests yeah. that, you know, it can um, take the most smartest of us um, in um, by surprise and, and human beings can get it, it to the addictive side of it. But what can we do to actually use neuropharmacology responsibly? Yeah, so, so yes, both neuropharmacology and neuromodulation are trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to change the way that our neurons fire. And one of the, dif the, one of the, the difficulties that we have with neuropharmacology is that uh, in most instances, you, you can't really have a targeted approach um, to the drugs that you're administering, because if you take them orally, they go throughout the body and they bind to the receptors that you're targeting, but those come in multiple areas. And so this is why you have certain side effects of, of drugs because they're binding on and acting on areas that you aren't intending to, to stimulate, right? And so I think one of the interesting, one of the most important things to do is to try to package and target specific, so to try to package drugs and target them in more specific areas. Because if you are only stimulating, um, uh, you know, a, a specific area, like let's say the basal ganglia for people with Parkinson's or something, if you are able to administer drugs just within that specific area, then you're going to have a lot, you can first make the potency a lot higher. And then second, um, you know, you're going to have a, a better effect and less, less side effects as a result of that. So it really has to do with, with targeting. Um, but I mean, in terms of how can we use it more responsibly? I mean, I think that that just has to do on the side of, of more research, trying to produce drugs that have the, the right effects that we want without producing side effects or these other things. I mean, it, it seems obvious, but I think that, you know, there really isn't much better of an answer than- Do you also think answer. that drugs um, are a very precarious uh, route to um, solving this problem? Because, you know, there are so many dependencies um, with different uh, clinical groups Mm -hmm. that can turn any uh, way um, it, it can go wrong if it can go wrong, uh, which is, you know, what is the um, reaction of um, drug on the body and how receptive body is to the drug. So we call it the pharmacodynamic dynamics or and pharmacokinetics. 
Um, and mm -hmm. these are some of the things um, that are serious issues, especially in human subjects. You cannot, you know, s simply play an experiment with different doses and, you know, if it works, you know, and what is um, the side reactions um, of th that. And so w when people talk about these things, um, there, there are certain rules um, that uh, apply uh, for the research in human subjects. And then we move on to neuromodulation, which uh, Yak Panksa uh, thinks um, can turn into um, a Nobel winning uh, research if that were to be allowed um, in um, human subjects, which certainly does not have um, as severe um, you know, drawbacks um, in human subjects. Um, have you looked into it? Into neuromodulation, electrical yes. neuromodulation? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that currently neuromodulation is the most promising neurotechnology that is out there it's also something that i've used um and was you the single so? thing why do i think so because it's already showing tremendous uh tremendous results in in multiple areas so there so for parkinson's treatment there's a technology called deep brain stimulation it's a large electrode that goes in and stimulates um a part of the basal uh, part of the basal ganglia to help regulate spastic uh, spastic movements. And that is implanted in, I think, about 200,000 people worldwide. So it's it's shown uh, quite a bit of efficacy. I also really like electrical neuromodulation because it is generally more reversible and controllable than uh, using a, a pharmaceutical. So we the one of the the things that I identify or the main thing that I identified that's important with with pharmaceuticals and just treating any um, brain or cognitive disorder in general is this idea of specificity. And so if you can stick an electrode in a very specific area, you have a high degree of specificity. Or if you're using a non-invasive device like TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which can be helpful in headache treatment, depression, anxiety, things like that, and has shown great results in those areas. Um, you can always shut it off. So if there is a bad reaction to it or it's not tolerated by the patient, they can often tweak that um, to change the, uh, the dosage, if you will, of the stimulation that the person is getting. And again, I think it's, I think it's really exciting in just its wide applicability. So I mentioned DBS, but a very similar uh, form factor device is used in spinal cord stimulation which can help with back pain, sciatica, leg pain, um, neuropathic pain. And it, and another, and again, a great thing about it is that often the patient can turn it up or turn it down based on their tolerance in that day. And that's not something that you can do with drugs. And so I think that it's, it's a really promising area and it's the area of neurotechnology that has affected, has affected the most people in, in a positive way so far. One caveat um, that could be a problem um, in wide scale adoption of um, the uh, neuromodulation methods um, is the sheer size um, of the instrument that we have at the moment, um, especially um, applied on people who have dementia because you know they kind of lose their sense of um, orientation. And uh, the other is how how fast the device would actually uh, be tied to the body part that you're trying to neuromodulate. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. if someone has dementia and they need this neuromodulation in order to sleep, and you know while they're sleeping, they're twisting and turning. You know how does it actually um, you know, stay um, with um, the area that you have actually glued onto? Then second is that how many um, electrodes would you actually need? You talked about one of those uh, women who was able to uh, drink. Um, um, milkshake um, from a prosthetic arm. She had uh, almost like 39 electrodes, if I'm not wrong. Um, but 100. then a uh, hundred, oh, sorry. And how many would you actually need for, for um, you know, patients like this um, in a compact form, which actually sticks? Well, I mean, that's a difficult question because it depends on the population and the, the thing that you're targeting, right? So with deep brain stimulation, for Parkinson's or something like that, or depression or anxiety. And obviously we're talking very, very severe anxiety or depression if we're gonna do brain surgery for it. But in those cases, two long electrodes are often sufficient to help out with that sort of thing. If, and same thing with, um, with like neuropathic pain in the spine. You can very simply just stimulate uh, an inhibitory response often in your target neurons that cause the pain to basically stop. And this is something that you can turn on and off. Now, 
another thing that I think that you're starting to get at is this idea of a closed loop system. So a closed loop system is going to take feedback from the brain and then use that to modulate the brain. So in these cases, someone might implant a strip of electrodes into, so a, a good example of this is for seizure detection and control. So what you might do for this is try to find the foci, which is the center of where seizures generally happen. And you're gonna put a strip of recording electrodes over that area and try to detect when a seizure is happening. And if you can detect that, then you can cause a, a DBS electrode or, or some other form of intervention to be immediately administered, um, which can then be helpful in trying to quell that seizure um, or try to quell tremors in, in other disorders. And so that's an essential piece. Um, but in terms of you know, treating all of the different uh, possibilities of what you can do, whether it's addiction or obesity or depression, anxiety, Parkinson's, all of these things, it needs uh, a very tailored approach because we're dealing with different areas of the brain. Well, you brought a wonderful point about um, seizures. I'm mean, going to talk uh, about this uh, with Greg also in terms of it's, it's a very hard problem detecting um, um, seizures uh, in epilepsy. Uh, and we've seen people who have been in a lot of pain um, when these issues just come. Uh, but one of the um, probably great uh, contributions of AI and machine learning in this sector could be um, the an anomaly detection between the normal brain um, functions and um, the onset of um, seizures. Do we have any clinical trials or experimentations um, in which we could um, identify the seizures before they actually come and uh, through neuromodulation we're able to, um, you know, evade them or at least, you know, alleviate them um, in some way? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's there's research in that area. Um, when you, if you go to the hospital for seizures, a lot of times what they end up doing is keeping you uh, strapped into an EEG headset for several days until you have a seizure. And what they'll do is record all of that information up until the seizure to try to do exactly what you were saying, which is have a, a better idea of what that person's brain looks like leading up to a seizure and during a seizure so that they can try to intervene at a, at a more appropriate time. Now, in terms of having like a, an algorithm that's, that's robust against a large population in terms of predicting a seizure, that's very difficult. Um, but I have seen some researchers uh, apply a more holistic approach where they use cameras and, and, uh, and other biosensors, maybe, maybe a watch, and try to put all of this together because I mean everything right now is just about data. So the more data that you can throw into a machine learning algorithm, the better uh, opportunities you have to detect these sort of things. Um, but seizure is a very, very specific response. Sorry for the train in the background. It's a very specific response um, or, or a, a waveform that is that is different from normal brain functioning. So it's it's easy to detect when it's going on, and we just need more data for the lead up to. Yeah, I think that's a good um, start, at least, um, in, for us to um, try to understand uh, the nature of this problem, and then you know, in future um, iterations of um, uh, effective therapy, will at some day uh, will be uh, seizure free, hopefully. Uh, but let's take a detour and talk about mm -hmm. uh, you um, as a person. I know we talked a little bit about your. Um, your uh, motivation to get into the field, um, certain disruption in your plans and how you actually sprung back from that. Um, there's always this one teacher who inspires us a lot um, and helps us a lot and you know, and gives us some kind of direction um, in, in, in life. So what was that figure for you? I mean, it doesn't really have to be a teacher, but I mean, there must be someone. Yeah, um, at RIT, Dr. Dan Phillips has been uh, an ardent supporter and has been my mentor pretty much since I came in here. So, so when I when I came to college, I wanted to study neurotechnology, which is really not a uh, undergraduate degree that exists. Neural engineering is starting to come out, which is which is really wonderful. Um, but it wasn't even just a couple of years ago a, a thing. And so I came to RIT because I saw that there was a individualized major, and where I could effectively create my own major and, and make it look like what I thought a neurotechnology degree would look like. 
Um, and one of the first people that I met when I came here, because I was saying, I want to do research, I want to do research, but RIT didn't have this research. And one of the, the people that I met early on was, was Dr. Phillips, who's an electrical engineer, but he has a background in, in neurophysiology as well, and used to do some research in the area. And I told him about my plans and what I wanted to do. And he took me under his wing and helped me meet some wonderful people at RIT and over at U of R as well, including RIT's VP of research who ended up funding us. And then Dan has been, I would meet with him for several years every week. And now we check in every, every couple of weeks. And he's been a consistent mentor with, here's how you should run a lab. Here is some technical advice. Um, and very quiet, very humble, does, <laughs> does not get the recognition that he deserves, but he does it because he, um, I, I think he, he believes in, in just helping people. He has uh, the, the main thing that he does at RIT as well is he runs an accessibility lab where he's helped support many um, projects similar to mine that is trying to address a need for uh, a disabled population. And so he's just very passionate about that stuff. He's supported so many students and um, you know I owe a lot to him as well. Yeah, I'm so thankful that we do have these unsung heroes, you know, um, who focus um, on um, building new things, even if uh, they don't exist and empowering other people, um, you know, chase their dreams. Um, yeah. And I, I was just wondering, one of the problems in neuroscience research that you're trying to um, cure, and you know, that seems to be your goal, is to create awareness and help people um, experiment and get started in the field um, in the hope that, you know, that will certainly give impetus to the research um, and eventually um, elevate human suffering. And one of the problems with that is that um, the instrumentation and the knowledge is very complicated. Um, so we have um, two options here. Um, if you talk about those big libraries like Stanford Medicine and Donders Institute and Harvard and other places, um, they use extremely expensive instruments like uh, Hypnodyne Z. It's around four thousand dollars for a complete package, you know, the biggest one, and then there are you know paraphernalia that adds up. Um, and a lot of people, especially people at home um, or in developing countries and universities, cannot really afford that. So an alternative way is to use um, starting. Uh, Equipment, um, for example, ones provided by OpenBCI, um, the one that you actually use also, you know, the scalp um, electrode one, um, already cost five hundred dollars. So, do you think that's one of the problems uh, in adaptions? Uh, Greg, my friend, is doing a great job uh, with his company Backyard Brains and you know, creating those cheap you know, instruments um, that you can you know, do um, an experiment in, in your garage or something. So, do you think that's one of the problems and? Is there kind of a Murphy's law um, that applies to that also that, you know, in future we're going to be seeing a lot cheaper um, instruments um, and a lot more accessible instruments? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we already are seeing that. So you mentioned that, you know, OpenBCI's hardware costs around $500, $500 to start and it, and it does, and that may seem like a lot, but it's nothing compared to what uh, research equipment uh, is and, you and, and used to be, right? So if you're working on traditional equipment like an EEG cap, people usually start being able to work with that when they're working in their PhD or late masters because the equipment is so expensive. EEG is considered a cheaper technology and you can expect to pay between 30 and $50,000 for a traditional EEG headset. And it's not that complicated in terms of what the actual headset is. It's, it's an electrode, it's, it's a wire and then an amplifier. And then you're just pulling that into a computer. But of course, all the hardware is specialized and whatever. And so what a lot of people have, have done really starting in, I would say with Emotive in uh, early 2000 is try to build these devices and make them consumer consumer devices so that it's it's more accessible. And so we saw that with Emotive where you're gonna look at paying about $1,500. Then OpenBCI came in and uh, brought that cost down. They address a little bit of a different market segment than, than Emotive does. Um, but I was even talking to some guys yesterday that are trying to start up an organization called Brains at Play. And they're looking at building a, an EEG device that can have up to 32 channels for, I believe it was $80 and then an FNIR's device, which I talked about earlier, measuring blood flow um, for about $120. Um, and I, I may have gotten the, the exact uh, numbers on that wrong, but it was, it was very cheap, right? And so the, the point of all this is that it's supporting 
citizen science and giving more people the ability to just experiment with this. Whereas before you'd have to dedicate, I don't know, six, seven, eight years before you can even start using this stuff. And so that opens the door for someone who is a software engineer um, or a biomedical engineer, even just a hobbyist to get this technology and play around with it because it's not a huge hole in their pocket to be able to use this. And in, in my view and in Colin, my business partner's view, and I, I imagine that Greg shares a, shares a similar view, the best way to advance the field forward is, is getting more people involved and giving more people the ability to start thinking about this technology and, and experiment with it. And so this is the main reason why we created BCI Guys. And our goal is to create resources that can uh, entice people to come into the field and then give them the basics to get started and then you know pass them off to whether it's a university or companies or whatever it is give them more resources to continue that journey but i think that's the the single most important thing to expanding the field because neurotech is very very small right now um but i think we're at a turning point where it will start to explode you were certainly saying a lot of growth um in the market and like you um said you know, the best way to inspire young generation um, to think about these problems um, and actually partake um, in those uh, efforts is to give them uh, the opportunity to participate hands-on um, in this thing. And this is why, you know, he's also expanding um, their footprints in different uh, places. Uh, you also have um, recently um, talked about the expansion of New York Tech X um, Latin chapter that goes into Latin America. Um, you know, going to different schools and uh, helping out people who want to get started um, in this. Tell us a, a little bit about how um, Neurotech is expanding throughout the world in areas which it might not be, seem like um, a very good um, and affordable option um, ge in general. Right. So this is this sort of speaks to the power, again, of making this technology as cheap as possible and, and educating people, because if we're talking about a traditional MRI machine, you're not gonna get one for less than $2 million. And an MRI machine in, in the United States and, um, and some of the, the richer countries has become a staple of, of neuroscience. We can just scan your brain and see, oh, you have a brain tumor, or we can start to diagnose other maladies. Oh, you had a stroke, things like that using this technology. And that has just sort of been around and I think is taken for granted here. But I have a friend in Nigeria uh, who, who told me that in their country of 200 million people, they have about 20 neuroscientists. And he lost a, a grandfather to a, brain, to a brain tumor, and I believe a brother or cousin as well. So people, people within his family, and they had no idea what happened until really the very late stages of life or after death. And so I think some of these technologies spreading around provides a good medical opportunity to empower people to be able to incorporate this into medicine in, in uh, smaller, less affluent areas. Um, but it also provides a potential economic hub because I think like we're already seeing billions and billions of dollars being filtered into neurotechnology. The graph is going up and to the right in terms of interest, money, um, and people involved. And so I think that what, what I'm hoping is that in some of these other countries where these initiatives are starting, that this can help them uh, get ahead into the future and start to develop out an industry there. And so also with my friend um, in Nigeria, he is uh, trying to build out a school that takes people in at around eight to 10 years old and brings them all the way up to college age to teach them about neurotechnology. And so we've talked about doing some sort of collaboration with BCI guys to help create that content. But I think that's a really wonderful thing. And I wanna see more initiatives like that supported worldwide. And NeurotechX, which if, if people don't know, is a community organization, a nonprofit that supports chapters around the world and clubs that compete in neurotechnology competitions. And I think that's a really wonderful opportunity for people anywhere, regardless of educational background or access to technology, to at least understand the tech and maybe find a way to apply it to their immediate lives. 
I mean, you know, one possibility that I have been thinking lately about um, that has been um, generated by the faster internet speeds in the world um, attaching to the internet grid mm -hmm. is the ability to remotely monitor patients. Um, so, for example, Hepna 9C um, that's used for the sleep experiments, you know, you can have multiple experimenters throughout the world, you know, looking at um, the brain wave generating. Um, um, as they are generated from the patient and, you know, they can have some kind of collaborative opinion on right. that. Um, and I'm just wondering if that's possible that, you know, certainly most of these countries won't be able to afford $2 million MRI machines, but if there's a, a way that, you know, you could have some kind of recorder um, in these mm -hmm. countries um, and then generate the data and then you can have some kind of a panel that would, um, like you said yourself, there are so many people who have lost their lives and only after their death they have been, you know, able to find out what the problem was and they could have, you know, saved some lives uh, if they knew beforehand what was happening. And I'm just wondering if there could be a collaboration where remote um, experts uh, will be able to help uh, people who are less equipped um, with the technology and that could have saved their lives. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is part of this is part of what I was getting at in terms of if we can distribute this technology worldwide, then then yeah, there's there's no reason why if we couldn't get um, doctors to volunteer their time to look at some data that we couldn't collect enough data from uh, from these from people worldwide to make some uh, diagnostic decisions. I mean, I I think that some of the challenges then become what are international and and national where the doctor is <laughs> regulations and, and and things around that but in terms of the technology um, I keep mentioning F, F nears um, that's sort of like your budget fMRI you can get some information into into brain data and then same thing with with other technologies that we talked about like the Apple watch you can get heart rate information and so all of this can, could probably come together to help with some diagnosis, which is stage one. The treatment is probably a, a more difficult question, but I, I really do hope that um, that becomes more prevalent that we can have international collaboration around medicine. I don't know much about that, but I'm just chasing a wild goose here. I'm just wondering what would yeah. be the most life um, saving uh, procedure um, that would pay off in um, the shorter in the shorter term, for example, MRI is probably a technology that will be way too expensive uh, for different countries. But there, are there alternative ways to find out a brain tumor, like through EEGs or EMGs or any other thing that will be able to predict some kind of an anomaly going on, which is a lot cheaper? And then when, when the data is transferred to expert panels uh, in more developed countries, they're able to predict something's wrong. And, you know, they recommend at least if MRIs. Um, I do know that, you know, uh, there are places where there are qualified doctors to be able to recommend um, advanced tests, but still, you know, that would be a great help if you could do that. Right. So with EEG, not so much, at least what I've seen. And again, not an expert on, on this particular area, but um, so EEG is measuring electrical activity. So that's, that's pretty difficult um, unless the tumor is causing um, such a large effect on brain function that it's changing these normal oscillating patterns that we see. Uh, I mentioned FNIRS before because FNIRS is measuring blood flow and locating where that blood flow is. And I would imagine, although again, not an expert, but I would imagine that uh, since a tumor is taking up a lot, of, a lot of blood, a lot of energy, that you might be able to see these localizations um, within the brain that could indicate uh, a tumor. More research needs to be done in this area to determine if that's possible, but I think that would be huge. And then just in terms of even not even necessarily neurotech, but I think that that mental health um, and, and cognitive disorders is probably one of the most important medical things that uh, needs to come to the, the developing world. And so I think using having worldwide counseling services or even implementing neurotechnology in such a way to help diagnose some of these illnesses um, would have probably the largest impact out of any uh, field of medicine. Um, yeah. 
one other avenue that we can explore probably and you talk about that in your videos um, is um, speech restoration um, so uh, the things related to our next area where you can actually help people to restore um, their lost speech by rewiring their um, neural pathways or whatever way there is in, in neuroscience. Talk a little bit about that. We certainly have cochlear implants now that actually um, give us an external um, way to enhance um, the problems with um, hearing, uh, but speech production is certainly a new ball game. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the speech process is, is complicated. So Wernicke's area, uh, as as you the Wernicke's area as you brought up is involved in understanding speech and understanding language um, and then that kind of gets uh, translated down through a couple other areas into Broca's area which is uh, thought of as like the main speech area so Broca's area is the, the the area of the brain that starts to initiate the muscles that will eventually produce the words that that we are trying to produce and so I've seen neuroprosthetic devices that, that try to record from Broca's area and that try to record from some later uh, motor pathways that are related to the muscles involved in speech. And so one really interesting study that, uh, that we actually covered in a video very recently took an electrode grid, um, which is considered semi-invasive. So semi-invasive means it's under the skull, but it's not penetrating brain tissue. And they put that over the part of the motor cortex that controls the muscles in the throat, in the tongue, in the face. And they were able to pretty reliably determine what word the person was trying to say, and the, the person was paralyzed and unable to speak um, out of a set of 50 words. And they were able to do this with a reasonable level of accuracy that could suggest that this could eventually become a, uh, a, a neuroprosthetic device that could be deployed clinically for people that are uh, not able to speak due to neuromuscular disorder. So for this to work, you have to have um, an understanding of language. So they had to be able to speak previously. Um, and basically they were just trying to speak and using a machine learning algorithm to look back at what neurons were firing and then correlate that to specific words. Um, Is it the I've one by, by the way, um, that Stephen Hawking was using? No, so Stephen, Stephen Hawking, wasn't using a brain computer interface. Um, he was using, uh, for most of his life, a little clicker um, where it would scroll across letters and then he would click to uh, indicate that he wanted to select that letter. Um, and then I believe he used eye tracking later in life, um, although not entirely sure on that. But in terms of for speech right now, the leading way uh, is using eye tracking. Um, because it's it's really accurate to be able to tell what someone's looking at but there are um so there's a system that i just talked about which was trying to pick out whole words but there are tons and tons and tons of brain computer interfaces that have tried to deal with typing so on the non-invasive side which um uh you know might be more interesting to people who don't have as limited abilities you have something called uh, a p300 speller which moves a line across a, a bunch of letters. And when your letter lights up, uh, if you're, so you focus on a letter, let's say you're focusing on the letter D. When D lights up, your brain gets surprised. And it's like, oh, my letter got lit up. And then you can see that response, uh, which happens about 300 milliseconds after the person's presented with the stimulus, hence the name. Um, and then you can use that to type. There's also another technology called SSVEP. Um, steady state visually evoked potentials where you can take a bunch of letters or objects on a screen and have them flash at different frequencies and amazingly pick up um, from the back of the brain that does your visual processing those exact frequencies that the person is focusing on. And so you can use that to then say, oh, uh, they're looking at the letter A because the A is firing at, or is flashing at six hertz and we can see uh, six hertz uh, frequency flashing in the back of the person's brain. So that stuff is cool. Um, but then to like really get into it, we can go into the invasive implants that use some sort of keyboard control. So the most common ones that I've seen um, are, they're actually done even like 20 years ago, move a cursor around on a screen. And so they can think, um, they can imagine that they're moving their hand around is usually what people do. 
and it moves this cursor around and they can select letters. And I highly recommend going to BrainGate's website, braingate.org, just flipping through some of these videos because it's really amazing to watch two people who are paralyzed and unable to speak have a conversation of a text conversation on some tablets just by moving a cursor around uh, in their mind. Another really cool one that we covered, um, some research came out of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, I wanna say back in, in uh, maybe June of, of 2021, that showed that someone, that you could pick up signals of someone imagining that they were handwriting letters. They're actually able to get 90 characters per minute just by uh, recording from the areas that would be associated with handwriting. And it's really incredible to see that stuff advancing. And um, I know there are a lot of companies that are working on turning that into a commercial technology um, within the next decade. And so that would obviously be a huge advancement to people that can't speak right now, because I mean, I, I can't imagine how scary it would be to be fully awake and conscious, but not able to communicate anything with other people. So I think that's a really important pursuit. It's incredible, you know, how um, deeply we understand now um, the parts of brain that are involved with um, the kind of um, functions we use, like uh, taste and smell and vision and um, hearing. And one of the curious cases um, that I shared um, a couple of weeks ago is um, an unbelievable example of uh, what we uh, know in neuroscience is called a, um, a homunculus. Um, you've probably seen this um, the, the diagram that is associated with that is associated with different parts um, of um, a human body and their functions in the brain. And one of the story is that this guy who climbed the Mount Everest um, and he was a blind guy. Um, so what they did is that they rewired his sense of vision um, to the sense of taste. So he would just um, find out his path uh, um, on the mountains through um, sense of taste. Um, and, you know, with the altitude would change, you know, his taste buds would change, which is unbelievable for me. So I'm just trying to work it out um, with you. Yeah, how does it actually work or possibly would have worked, you know, if you were to, you know, um, gesture about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll talk about we'll talk about homunculus first because it's an important concept to understand. So you have both a motor homunculus and a sensory homunculus. And so the sensory homunculus is correlated to to touch, your your sense of touch. And there are parts of your there are parts of your body that are very overrepresented in your brain. So your face and your hands have a lot of brain space relative to their size because you need to have a lot of very specific information coming from uh, those areas. Whereas your back um, or your chest has comparatively very few neurons dedicated to it because even though our brains are big, we are dealing with, very, we are dealing with limited space in the skull. And so we have to figure out how to prioritize that. But the interesting thing is that when if you lose a certain sense, or let's say you lose um, an arm, then the part of the brain that was previously associated with either controlling that or sensing uh, information from that can start to be overtaken by neighboring areas. And so this homunculus, this, this little um, image of a man that we can have in our mind that's represented by where the, the information is coming from can start to change. And very interestingly, um, the areas of the brain that might process vision, like you said, could start to process some information um, from other senses if it's correlated to something like a camera and presents itself like visual information. So what I've seen a lot of people do, and this is called sensory substitution. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, I recommend checking out David Eagleman. He's like, he's the guy for this stuff, but um, yeah, I wish times, you know I could have got him in the podcast. He's just so busy. Yeah. And I reach out to him. He's such a wonderful guy. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's very cool. But they so they use something like a electrode pad that goes on the tongue um, that I've seen, and then you you know have a hundred electrodes or however many electrodes and um, stimulate based on visual signals that a camera is picking up. And and amazingly, you start to see. Uh, areas of the brain associated with, with sensation or in the visual areas start to interpret this information coming in and dedicating brain space to that. Um, same thing sort of happens when you lose an arm. The, the areas of the brain nearby recognize that those neurons aren't firing anymore 
And so they start to take it over. And this is, and this is something that's consistent throughout the brain and, and the underlying principle of neuroplasticity, which is use it or lose it. If you're not using certain neurons, those neurons get unhappy and they go to their friends nearby them and say, okay, how can I help in this task? And they start to work in that task as well because neurons don't like to be quiet. Um, so yeah, that's that's all interesting. And, and David Eagleman's lab, one thing that they did to, uh, to prove that, that this works, which I think is really interesting, is they hooked a participant up to the stock market using vibration motors on their, on their vest. And the person had this intuitive sense of what the stock market was doing. Now, he couldn't say like, oh, it's gone up 0.24% today, but could tell you pretty reliably like, oh, it was a, it was a good day today, or oh, things are going, going downhill right now. And I think it's just very interesting how the brain can take pretty much any consistent form of information and make sense of it relatively quickly within a couple of days. And so that provides us with a lot of um, exciting possibilities of having neuroprosthetics that could give us uh, other abilities, like maybe seeing a different wavelength of light or, or something like that, um, or having, you know, a third Doc Ock arm or whatever it is um, coming out of us. It's, it's, it's interesting to think about, and it goes back to the brain just being uh, a blank slate that can take on so many different tasks. Funny to talk about it, actually, that, you know, the, the, um, the stock market, uh, metaphor uh, you also talk about uh, some something called um, symphony listening um, and in yep. your videos and I was wondering just you know going wild here if if we can actually with certain certitude um, establish um, the activity of our um, brain during one activity and if we were to record randomly someone throughout the day we shouldn't be we able to be actually uh, precise to predict what they have been doing throughout the day you know this thing symphony or you know losing the, in the stock market or you know climbing the mount everest um theoretically at least so could we based on the data that we're collecting from their brain is that is that what you're asking yeah for example i don't know if you're familiar with this there was this uh one um, anecdote and you know it got um, really um turned out to be a meme on the internet called Jennifer Aniston neuron. Um, so, you know, yeah. whenever you <laughs> you saw her picture, you know, there was only this one neuron firing. I don't even know about um, its scientific val validity. But, you know, the idea is that, you know, if you're able to pinpoint our activities uh, through brain activities so accurately, why can't we actually just uh, simply record one day and predict what this guy has been doing uh, all this time? Yeah, so the the challenge again is neuroplasticity and differences in brains because our neurons are changing all the time and these pathways are changing but i'll, I'll talk to the jennifer aniston thing because we actually did cover that in the course and it, it's kind of a it's kind of a fun example um so they so some researchers placed an electrode uh in in a person's brain and they discovered i don't know exactly how but they discovered that this person's uh this neuron was responding very consistently to seeing jennifer aniston's face um, and wouldn't respond to other similar faces. It was able to, to determine between them. And now this was almost definitely not the only function of this neuron. I'm sure this neuron did many other things um, because it wouldn't be super efficient to have one neuron dedicated to each person that we saw, but it's basically uh, used to illustrate this point of, of how our brains learn. And so when we take in information, we have um, we, we start at the level of just trying to figure out edges. So we just try to figure out in little spots of our vision where there are edges. And then we try to turn those edges into shapes and we incorporate colors. And then once we've done that, we try to look for features. So we say, oh, this person has hair and whatever color eyes Jennifer has. And, you know, it's like this certain body type and whatever. And then the, the brain fires on and neurons fire on probabilities. So once a neuron reaches threshold, which means that enough neurons have said, uh, and enough neurons have represented features that tells this neuron that Jennifer Aniston is there, then that neuron says, okay, I'm you know 90% certain that this is Jennifer Aniston, so I'm gonna fire. And then that neuron goes out and it's connected to neurons that might say, her name is Jennifer. This is how we pronounce this. Here's a fun memory that I have of her on Friends, or this is what she sounds like and all of these things. And so it's a good illustrative point of, of um, like how this process of, of neuroplasticity works and then also how we store memories in the brain. Um, 
and, and so yes, if you if you knew the if you knew what was happening in someone's immediate life, you could start to find neurons that would fire in response to situations. And sure, if you had a good enough algorithm and, and good enough coverage, you could understand if they saw certain people in the day or did certain things. Um, but you know, this this is in a sense an oversimplification for what's going on because there are likely multiple neurons that fire when they see Jen and maybe that same neuron fires when it sees a banana. Um, it's just that these pathways kind of cross in a, in a specific way. So you'd have to like really isolate what's firing when you see something, but sure, yeah, you could do that, why not? Um, you probably know that already, um, that the concept um, in, um, in machine learning, artificial intelligence called neural network comes from um, neuroscience, um, yeah. wh which uh, takes inputs um, of different modes. It could be image data or the video data or audio data or CSV files and, you know, uh, put that through a, a complex computational um, algorithm. And then in the end, we have um, an output. Um, and these neural networks are becoming deeper and deeper, power hungry, storage hungry. Um, so we have been able to achieve a lot um, in different domains, um, self-driving cars, um, fraud detection, anomaly detection, things like this. And theoretically, um, because you talked about, and I was talking recently to a friend of mine at Facebook um, about graph um, neural networks that actually um, form forms a grid-like shape and that connects um, all the nodes uh, with each other and try to find out some kind of structure in that. Uh, essentially, through its simple form, um, brain is a neural network. Um, mm -hmm. The only problem that we have um, in, in reaching the artificial general intelligence is the amount of connection that the brain has. Um, 85 billion neurons, um, over 700 million um, edges. Um, it's impossible to compute with all the compute power in the world. Do you really think that uh, we are able to recreate a brain theoretically if we, we had the necessary power and we were able to predict everything that the brain that's going on in the brain? Yes, I, I do, um, but it requires us to understand more about ourselves before we're even able to do that. Because neural networks are neural networks in computers are a good way to conceptually understand what's going on in the brain. And I think that computational neuroscience is, uh, which uses a lot of neural networks to try to simulate how, how thoughts work, is helping a lot in advancing brain research. But what's actually going on under the hood is so much more complex in in a brain, because at an individual synapse level, you have uh, you have chemical properties that that play a role. One neuron, when it fires, releases a package of neurotransmitters into a synapse, which then has to find its way through random movement onto a onto a protein a protein channel that opens, lets in ions, and then these things all based on the amount of ions coming in and from however many inputs, this is what causes the neuron to decide to fire or not. And even that is like, a, I'm really, really simplifying the, the process that's underlying this. And so to, re, to actually uh, simulate the brain, like we need so much more computing power than we actually have um, to be able to, to simulate all of these things because you need randomness and you need um, so many other elements and to be able to connect and destroy connections in these simulated neurons. So we have to understand sort of the basic building blocks of what consciousness is, if that's what we want to incorporate into artificial intelligence and if, if that's what we mean by, by intelligence. And so I think consciousness is, some of the leading theories are that consciousness is an emergent property. There don't appear to be individual areas in the brain that we can point to and say, ah, this is our consciousness area. It just seems to be that consciousness arrives from uh, properties that are, or from things that are uh, firing together. So we have uh, vision that we're seeing that's firing at this point, and then thoughts and, and memories that it's triggering over here. And all of these areas working together creates this conscious experience. And I think that the best way to think about this and understand it is to understand that the brain is a cheater. Like that we, our brains are built to try to simplify as much information as possible and shortcut wherever it can. So our brains, I, I think thinking of neural networks really helps us appreciate how incredible our brains are that can store up to a quadrillion bytes and that run off of the energy from an apple. 
Um, and, the, and the way that they do that is by taking shortcuts. So we are taking in very limited information coming in from our eyes and our brains are predicting what we see. We have a blind spot in our eye that we're not aware of and we really only have um, good color vision in about a five degree area right in front of right in front of where we're looking and from this from small eye movements and the data that the brain is coming in and previous data that it understands the brain is creating the simulation of what we are of what we are looking at um, and so I think that this this type of idea is important to understand when just understanding what consciousness is because consciousness itself I think is a shortcut to understand the immense amount of information that is around us we don't think in terms of seeing um, seeing like geometric shapes around us and angles and all of these things that a that a computer might do right now. Instead, we just have this perception of everything that's going on because the brain has taken in this data from the environment and sort of dumbed it down in a way that we can express this consciousness, which generally helps us make decisions and stuff. And so I think for consciousness to emerge, you almost need to have like you have to like simplify things simplify complex information down enough where it makes sense efficiency wise to just sort of perceive it as opposed to understand every individual element of it i hope that makes sense it does actually but you know it kind of um spawns more questions and then it answers for example um but, I think about uh, computational, computational neuroscience all the time. I, I read a lot of books, and I think a lot of techniques that we use um, in optimizing artificial neural networks and deep neural networks um, actually applies in human life also. For example, we use some kind of uh, dropout regularization to make our model more sparse, so it takes less space, you know, it's computationally more effective. And I think at some level, we do the same thing in our lives also. So, for example, if I were to use the same example, then the brain has unlimited power uh, out of all the categories calories that we eat, 25% uh, goes to brain, which is only like 2.2 pounds or something. Uh, that tells us that it's kind of the powerhouse of all we do. But we, to make things easier, to simplify and making decisions, we also do a lot of stereotyping and categorization to make sense of the yes. words. So, you know, people um, have in-groups and out-groups, foreigners, um, immigrants, races, um, mm -hmm. ideologies, religions, languages. You know, we categorize ourselves to make things a lot easier for us. And I think that has to do something with our in innate capacity or incapacity to process a lot of information to its, um, it, its simplest depth. Uh, do, do, do you get the feeling that you know that our brain makes things uh, easier for us in a lot of ways, but also kind of in its simplicity, um, kind of creates different divides as well? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the reason why humans always fall into categories, into certain linguistic patterns, is because again, we are looking for efficiency. And it makes sense and we need these. And can that create problems? Absolutely. I think, you know, uh, people's tendency to, um, the, like a tendency for some people to be more racist or think of certain groups in, in a certain way is obviously a, a, a big problem as, as a result of that. Um, but, but yes, we, we do that to try to understand specific information. So if you're talking about me, you might say, oh, Harrison is, a white guy with brown hair who lives up in Rochester, New York and wears a lot of blue as I'm wearing right now, right? And then that remembering those attributes or, or physical features um, about me is a lot easier than trying to remember like the angles of my face and every like specific pixel for lack of a better word, our brains don't really see in pixels, but you know, pixel for lack of a better word, um, it's much easier to just have these classifiers. And this is how the brain organizes everything is in terms of features and trying to extract back to extrapolate back to what we're what we're actually seeing and organize information. And, and that's, you know, a step that I think neural networks are taking. A lot of it is trying to build things into features, but it's but categorization underlies pretty much everything in cognition that we have. You no, know, one of the theories that I have, I have developed, and I think we are not very different uh, from other um, animals in this regard, is that in most cases, um, no matter how logical we think we are, um, our old 
brain system or primitive brain systems, um, the limbic system takes over our logical thinking in many decision making processes. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, uh, people, and it's, it's very fa- common observation that people might remember um, what you said or not, but they will definitely remember how you made them feel. And I think that yes. this that this feeling, um, you know, part of the equation takes over a lot of our logical thinking. You know, that can can be a good thing also. That gives us a lot of romantic movies, but also give us wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm just right. wondering, is that is that your has that this been your been your experience been, um, or is this your observation um, around the world that, for example, why do doctors um, smoke um, or drink or obese, even though they, they know the best that you know that's probably not good for them to you know, have those greasy fries and steaks every day um, but people yeah. just like it because it makes them feel good and you know it's kind of um, you know feel good um, eating ice cream binge um, so yeah. if, if that weren't from our limbic part where did, where, where else does it come from no well yeah you're you're hitting on it you're hitting on it perfectly and yes the 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 limbic system and and associated areas are involved in addiction and, and all of that stuff as well but um, but yeah so you've Let's see what what do I want to say here? I mean, it's we are. Well, let's actually put that together. No, no. <laughs> yeah, but for we example, are, check out. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I, I I got it now. But um, we are we we are subject to our neurochemistry, right? And that's ultimately ultimately what we are. And our brains were created to help us survive in in the world around us. And again, talking about categorization. Emotions are a great way to categorize um, what is going on. Because again, it's not like, unless I'm trained to do this, I'm looking at you and I'm noticing individual muscles in your face and I'm trying to think, oh, he's mad at me right now, or oh, he's happy or, or all of these things. But I can just try to perceive what emotion you might be feeling. And that's something that I, as another human, can conceptualize and understand, even if I'm not like, logically taking quantitative data down on what I'm perceiving about you. And, and same thing with, you know, with, with addiction. Our brains have wired us to receive reward. And the things that it has, that it has given us reward for, reward feelings, are good food, sex, happiness, music, things like this. And that can easily be played on um, by certain drugs. And we're just subject to that biology and a lot of times that can take over uh, logical thinking because that is because the brain sees that information as very critical and important to pay attention to. Well, maybe it's not um, as perpetually and competitive, um, you know, contradicting uh, parts of the brain. For example, um, you use your brain to think about neurotechnology, create new things, um, tell other people uh, about it. But the, the idea comes from your passion and how you feel yeah. about things. You know, they're kind of uh, they can be aligned uh, in some way, and you know that inspire people to create new things that they feel good about, um, and right. using their prefrontal cortex. Um, to come up with intelligent ways of doing this. Um, talk a little bit about your future plans. Um, you're about to graduate um, soon, hopefully, and we're going to go directly to the master's, um, PhD, or you're going on more on the business side. Um, what's up ahead for BCA guys? Uh, more on the business side for now. So I've constructed my, my education, both formally and informally, to try to set myself up for a managerial role. So neuroscience is my primary focus, but then business, I also have a background in design and CS. And I've been working with Colin, who's a software engineer on on a couple different things over the years. And right now we've settled on one, working on BCI guys, which helps us build out a network and helps inspire uh, hopefully more people to join into the field. And then we're also working on building uh, an aggregative research environment platform that helps improve productivity um, and collaboration within uh, within research. So, and this there's a heavy like data security focus and all that stuff. Unfortunately, I can't talk a ton about that right now because we are still in the early stages of development and have a, a pending uh, or we're working on getting our patent. So um, maybe we'll check in in, in a little bit, but, um, but yes, it's the entrepreneurial route um, working on those two things, uh, and then 
if that doesn't work out or if it does in a few years, um, I would probably go for either a PhD in neuroscience or an MDA or an MBA with a um, focus in neuroscience. There are some programs that do that. Um, but right now I am itching to work on my own projects. And so that's the plan. Um, finally, you also talk a lot about um, philosophy of neuroscience. Um, yeah. You talked about um, Nietzsche um, and all these great thinkers about, you know, what is what it is to be human. And, and if we um, enhance our cognitive abilities um, through the affordances of technology, uh, are we really then human beings? I talk about cyborgs um, in Sweden, they're coming up with chips. Um, and a lot of people are having this implant uh, in their bodies um, f- to, you know, enhance their abilities, you know, go through airport securities faster, you know, have uh, um, some you know, fast track applications um, through government um, programs. And um, it it seems like with Neuralink and other other companies, um, it will become a norm at some point um, where people would um, enhance their bodily functions through these technologies. Um, What would a new society or culture look like? Um, Would we be then called humans um, if we are all enhanced by some uh, technological evolution? What would be the downside of that? Um, There's been a significant debate um, in recent days um, on uh, Facebook's um, unethical practice. We have a whistleblower now. Um, There are certainly body images issues with young teens um, on Instagram. Uh, Suicides are on the high. um, You know, people feel depressed at this competition. In it, there was a time when you used to have a competition with your neighbor in a small village, you know, there was so much competition. If you were the best guy there, you would at least live a happier life. But now you have a city and, you know, a whole world to compare yeah. yourself with. Um, so uh, do you think about the philosophy of um, bodily enhancement um, and the whole technological landscape and how that's going to affect us? Yes, absolutely. And so to the question of what is the future going to look like? that is up to us to determine what that is, which is why I think that a focus on ethics and philosophy is so important. And it's why I think for me, it's one of the most interesting areas of neurotechnology. Because I mentioned, we talked a little bit about consciousness before and consciousness is our brain simulation of what is going on around us. And that can be heavily influenced by things that we believe and and it can be changed. And so it's definitely possible for neurotechnology to start changing our percepts of what consciousness is to be able to, there are plenty of of people that are very interested in and and working on ways to, or thinking about a a future where we can enter ourselves into a video game. We're starting to get there with VR, Um, but sort of like upload ourselves to a simulation, all of these crazy things. And that brings into a question of what is a human, which is a question that I grapple with a lot because I don't, have a, I don't have a great answer for that. For me, I think of being human as, I think of, of human as a concept because as opposed to homo sapien as the biological organism that we are. Because throughout you know, history, people have used uh, the word human and, and derivations on that to talk about things that aren't biological, that are, you might say, oh, she's superhuman, she's so smart, she's more than human or that's inhumane, something that that, uh, someone has done that we think is terrible. And so we modify this word. And to me, that means that being human is something more than just our biological self, but it's something that our mind creates. And for me, that's like curiosity and innovation and learning and, um, and emotions and sharing with each other. And so my like idyllic future incorporates technology that is enhancing these abilities innate in ourselves. And to me, innovating and and using more technology makes us more human because to me, that is all of our technology is a subject of our creation. Now, it's very, very important to put guardrails up around that because we can start to like, as, as you mentioned with Facebook, there are some tremendously negative side effects that we can have with that. And neurotechnology terrifies me on some level because you could stimulate um, the the dopamine producing parts of the brain that are in our reward circuits in the basal ganglia. And there has been research that's been done that hooked a rat up to 
uh, an electrode that could stimulate that it could stimulate itself um, to give itself uh, more dopamine. And it just did that until it died. It just kept pressing it, pressing it, pressing it, pressing it until it keels over because that's just the way that our brains are wired. And it goes into that previous conversation that we talked about, about us being our biology. So again, part of the reason that we do BCI guys is because we want to build as much awareness around this as possible so we can get ahead of, ahead of it before it becomes a problem and build this technology out in a way that I think will enhance what it means to be human and improve our quality of life um, to the extent that we can. Because whether we want it to or not, um, Facebook's working on it. You know, a, a lot of these large companies have a say in neurotech, so it's going to happen. So we better educate ourselves and figure out what that ideal future looks like for us. Um, Harrison, it was such a pleasure talking to you at your age. Um, very few people think about uh, complicated issues um, in neurotech and life and society. Um, what our future is going to look like. Um, it's such an honor to talk to someone who is um, so optimistic about our future and doing something about that coming from your own um, background. You've always been a, a progressive child. I wish you well with your um, company and both your studies. Um, and thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. It was it was great to, to have a conversation. And I love that it's this long form podcast because we get to kind of cover everything and just have a, a good conversation without worrying about being cut off. But thank you so much. Thank you.